Okay, great. I think we can go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda from the Toronto Sustainability Committee. Uh, welcome to the talk on plant care. Uh, it's going to be hosted by Emma here. Uh, she's from the Urban Botanist and they're based in Ottawa. Uh, just before we start, she'll go over some housekeeping rules. So Emma, just pass it on to you. But hope everyone has a great time and we will talk again at the end when we have our question session. Perfect. Thank you so much, Amanda. Welcome everyone to our session uh, this evening. I'm so excited to be here and uh, being able to share my passion for plants with all of you lovely people whose faces I can't see, but I'm imagining you all staring back at me with big smiling faces. I tend to ask a lot of questions to the group as if I'm sitting in front of you all in person. So if I'm kind of like asking you a question, I don't really expect anyone to kind of respond back. Of course, I know that there's a lot of people joining us today. So we will ask that you keep your um, computers muted as well as your screen off just for the time being while I go through um, the session. Towards the end of the workshop, I reserve about the last 15 to 20 minutes for Q and A, um, I find that there tends to be a lot of questions. People at home that have their plants, they're not sure what they are, they're not sure what's happening to them, or just general plant care questions. Um, we will again still request that you keep your computer on mute. Um, as much as I would love to have face to a face to face with all of you individually, um, it can take up a lot of time when we have you know fifty to seventy people joining us today. So what we'll have you do is if throughout the workshop at any time right now in five minutes at the very end of the workshop throughout our actual Q&A session, you can just click on the chat button and type your question within the chat. Um, we'll have a mediator, it'll be Amanda, who will go through the questions and read them out to me herself at the end of the session. So hopefully I'll be able to get to everyone's questions at that point. If you haven't already, um, make sure that you have pinned my screen. And to do that, you can just scroll to my name, which is uh, in the chat section or, you know, my actual screen itself. And there will be three little dots, which you can click and select pin video. So that's how you'll be uh, able to pin my video. So if everyone can just take a moment now to make sure that you are indeed on mute. Some people don't always know if they're on mute and then their dogs start barking or their doorbell rings or something happens and then we hear that in the background and it's all good it happens we're all getting used to this new technology world um but just kind of take a little no take a little peek there and make sure that you are indeed on mute and that will just kind of help with the whole process of everything so yeah that's it for housekeeping we're ready to get started as Amanda mentioned, my name is Emma. I'm from The Urban Botanist, which is an Ottawa-based Ottawa company, which I started about three years ago. And I started this company with the intent of encouraging people to engage with nature in an urban setting. I find that nowadays, especially since the whole COVID crisis, we have begun feeling really starved for that connection with nature. Um, you know, modern day technologies and societies are almost designed to alienate us from the natural world. And, you know, this can kind of creep up in our day to day lives as, you know, maybe it's constant migraines or it's anxiety, it's fatigue. There's just not that extra pep in your step. And I am a huge advocate and huge believer in that sometimes a very simple solution to those problems is just engaging with nature. Now, what is engaging with nature, Emma? What does that mean? Like, do I have to go out for a walk? Maybe you live in the city and you're quite far from the green belts or, um, you know, any nature trails. And it can actually be as simple as having a house plant or having a little herb garden. So it's something that everyone can do in all shapes and spaces. We're going to talk about what types of plants work in what types of spaces, depending on how much sunlight you get or how little sunlight you get. Are you kind of a brown thumb gardener and you become quite forgetful and you forget to water your plants and they die after a month? We're going to talk about all of that and I am sure to have the house plant for you. So as I mentioned, engaging with nature can be as simple as having a house plant. It can be 
having a little herb garden that you interact with and engage with on a daily basis. My lifestyle has totally changed since I started incorporating daily nature into my routine. And um, I hope that this is something that I can encourage you and inspire you at home to do yourselves. And I can almost guarantee you that you will feel the immediate relief of, you know, that stress relief, those endorphins coming through. And you just, there's something about growing something, watching a new leaf come out or a new flower or a new stem um, that is just so rewarding. You feel like you've really contributed to the life of something beyond yourself. It's almost the same with a pet or something like that. But there's something about plants and that just make people happy. And we're going to talk all about that today. So has anyone heard of negative ions? You can say yes in your head. You can say nothing. You can say no. You can type it in the chat, whatever you're comfortable with. But negative ions are actually something that plants release. It's also something that moving water releases. And you know when you're around a river or a waterfall and there's just some sort of calming effect. And what negative ions do is they actually attach themselves to positive ions or to, um, you know, particles in the air that have allergens in them, um, negative kind of electricity, sort of negative vibes. And I know it might sound a little bit woo woo, but plants do release negative ions and it's scientifically proven. And what those negative ions do is they help to actually really calm your space, really help to remove a lot of that bad energy in the air, which is kind of cool in itself. Apart from that, of course, you probably all know that plants are responsible for consuming carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen. So having more plants in your space is actually improving the air quality within your home or your office or your cubicle. Another amazing thing about plants. Now, some plants in particular are exceptionally good at doing this process in the, in the sense that they actually remove impurities from the air, similar to the negative ions. They're removing things from the air like benzene, formaldehyde, ammonia, a lot of the net, a lot of the uh, toxic chemicals that are given off from paints in your house, from soaps, cleaning products, all those, all of those sorts of things. NASA actually did a study not too long ago um, talking about the clean air study. It was called the clean air study, mind you. And what they did was they took some of the most common household plants and determined which plants were the most efficient and effective at removing those impurities from the air. I'm going to share with you some of those plants because I'm sure some of you are thinking, I need to have those plants, whatever they are, I'm getting them. And they're not gonna be these crazy things that you have to order online or you have to go to this rare and unusual plant store. Most of these plants are available at your home heart, at your home depot rather, um, Ikea, Canadian Tire, a lot of them are very common household plants. Um, so one of them is this guy here. Does this look familiar to you folks at home? This is kind of a common plant. A lot of people maybe have seen this in their grandmother's kitchen while growing up. It's just, it's a classic, classic green, tropical, beautiful plant. Um, and this is called a pothos or a devil's ivy. For my brown thumbers out there, my black thumbs, which I don't honestly believe in, everyone is able, able to grow something. Um, it, just, it just comes down to having the right information, right? But for anyone who is kind of like, oh, I don't really have a green thumb, this is a great starting point, is something like this. They're beautiful. They have nice trailing growth to them, so they really can fill you know, a nice bookshelf or, um, you know, the top of a counter. Um, but these are called a pothos or devil's ivy. These were included in NASA's study for the, as one of the top five plants that remove toxins from your air. How amazing is this? These are also just super low maintenance. They're called devil's ivy because you literally cannot kill them. Of course, you can technically kill anything that's living. 
but they're really low maintenance. You can forget to water this thing for a month. A month goes by and they're fine still. So they're pretty amazing. I definitely recommend this plant for most of you beginners at home or for those of you just looking to grow your plant collection. These are a really great plant um, for growing your plant collection at home. Another cool thing about these plants and about so many others is that they're very easy to propagate. Does anybody know what propagating means? I'll just have you think about that for a minute. Let me get my scissors. So propagating is basically the process of making several small plants out of one mother plant or cloning. And it is dead easy, I promise you. So again, a great way to turn one plant into several plants that you can either build your own plant collection with. If you've got a big bookcase at home and you really want to fill it up with plants, you can start off again with something like this. I'm going to show you how to propagate in just a minute. Or if you're just kind of looking to, yeah, give some easy gifts. Um, this is another a great idea for that. So how to propagate a plant for water propagation. Now you see the stem here, anywhere on the main stem of a plant where the petiole or the stem of a leaf meets the main stem. So that would be right there. See the leaf has a stem and it meets the main stem. That's called a node. And basically at any, at any node along a stem, you can just take a cut right below it. So you can see what I mean here. There's that, there's that stem or petiole, and there's a node right there. And you can almost actually even see some little nubs, which are the starting of roots. This is a plant to be, believe it or not. So with a plant like this, you can take cuttings of it, just like I've shown you here. All you need is a clean cup, some water, and you can just put your cutting inside of your water like this. And in about four weeks or so, you'll start to see roots coming out of that cut point that you made. And this is what propagation is. So it's kind of a cool little science experiment, something fun to do at home with your kids in showing how easy it is for these plants to replicate themselves. And again, it's just a really rewarding kind of experience, seeing the roots coming out, being able to then repot your plant and knowing like, hey, wow, I'm basically a scientist. I did this myself. So it's kind of cool and another really cool way to engage with your plants at home. Now, Emma, I don't want to get into the whole propagation. Like, I'm not crazy about plants. I don't need to be cutting them and filling all the little knickknacks, glass knickknacks at home that I have with plant stems. Like, I'm just not going to do that. So how should I interact with my plants at home if I'm not going to be taking cuttings of my pothos? Maybe all you have at home is a little succulent or, you know, a little snake plant. It can be as easy as watering your plant and kind of noticing, oh, geez, is the soil really dry today? Hmm. It kind of forces you to stop, pause, and just, I call it mindful horticulture. It kind of forces you to be in the moment and really forces you to recognize and, and register what is going on with this living, breathing organism. It almost dates back to, it almost dates back to, you know, our, our ancestors and how we evolved. We evolved alongside plants. So it's only natural for us to want to go back to that mind frame and feel that connection and feel that warmth and comfort. I'm sure all of you know at home that having a space filled with greenery just automatically softens the space. It automatically breathes life into a space. And that's really why. So Let's go back to um, easy plants and back to the NASA top study. Another one that I'm going to recommend to you. This one probably looks super familiar to most of you at home. This is a Sansevieria or snake plant. Mother-in-law's tongue is another nickname for this plant. Um, 
and it's actually a succulent and people you may have heard of a succulent it's kind of been a really um trendy plant that's been um you know on the uprise for the last few few years but basically a succulent plant is anything with really thick fleshy leaves especially in comparison to this pothos right this pothos has you know really thin kind of just average uh, thickness of leaves where something like this has a really thick fleshy body and that's actually a really good indication for any plants that you have at home that maybe you're not sure how much water to give it you're not sure um, how much sunlight it needs a really good indication for how much water a plant needs is how thick are the leaves how thick are the stems this plant for example has these really thick fleshy leaves and that essentially works as a water reserve for these plants. It's the same with cacti. How many people have killed a cactus? This is a safe space. I'm sure a lot of you at home are nodding your heads. You're like, yeah, I thought cacti, I thought you couldn't kill cacti. I thought they were the easiest plants to, to care for. Yes and no. Similar to the snake plant, they have these big, thick, fleshy bodies. Of course, not exactly the same shape, but it's essentially the same in that it's an evolutionary adaptation that these plants have taken on to withstand long periods of drought, to withstand harsh conditions. Of course, cacti growing in the desert. Now, keeping that in mind, and another reason why I love recommending snake plants to new plant parents is because they don't need to be watered all that frequently. Like you could get away with watering these plants maybe once a month, maybe once every six weeks. They're very, very low maintenance because they have these big, thick, fleshy bodies, similar to a cactus, these big succulent bodies that are holding all of that water as a backup source. So that's typically how most people kill their all of their plants, not just their cacti, cacti especially, is by overwatering. So that's a really good tip that I'd like to share with you all as well, is when in doubt, don't water. I find, and not even I find, it is truly one of the main causes for plant fatality at home for your houseplants is people overwatering. People will bring their plants home and they're like, I'm going to be the best plant mom plant dad ever and I'm going to water my plant every single day. No, 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 no. Get that idea out of your head. Um, most plants do not need to be watered every day. Outdoor, different story. We're talking about indoor plants here, but there are not really any plants that you need to be watering every single day. There's like a few that I water every two days or so. And that's only in the summertime. In the winter, even less, of course. Why less in the winter, Emma? Great question, Emma. The reason for that is because plants go dormant, all of your house plants. So if you have plants at home and maybe you find in the winter they struggle and you're probably thinking, oh, they're struggling because it's cold. Oh, they're struggling because there's not as much sunlight. And you would be right about the second part. There's not as much sunlight. Our days are shorter. So our plants are not photosynthesizing as often, meaning that they're not creating energy from the sunlight that's coming through our windows. So because they're not creating as much energy, they don't need as much water to fuel that energy. Essentially, they go dormant. So you don't need to water them as often at all. In fact, most of my house plants during the winter months, I maybe water once a week. But back to that rule of thumb of when in doubt, don't water. My other little trick that I like to do is I do the two knuckle rule. I do this throughout the winter and the summer because it can't really steer you wrong. It's hard for me to say, oh, you know, water your plant once a week, water your pothos twice a week because everyone's space is different. One person's home may have a whole lot of windows and a lot of light and a, and a lot of warmth where someone else's home may be really dry or really humid. Really what it comes down to is everyone's space is different and you wanna focus on the soil. So back to that two knuckle rule. What I'll do is I'll stick my finger in about two knuckles deep into the soil. 
if you're really not sure, this is a great practice. And if I'm feeling any sort of any sort of moisture within that two knuckle uh, section of the soil, I know that I can leave it and not water it for a couple more days. If I'm feeling that that soil is bone, bone dry, perfect. I know that I can now give it a good watering. Any sort of moisture, I leave it. Most plants really like to have the top two inches of their soil dry out before watering. And that's especially true for cacti. Cacti need to have all of their soil completely dry out before being watered again. And you know, it's kind of interesting. You got to think about these plants' natural history. Of course, it's not natural for any of these plants to be growing inside of your condo downtown or in your suburban townhouse. This just isn't natural. Uh, we've essentially plucked these plants out of their um, traditional ecosystems and are trying to replicate their ecosystems inside of our homes. So I always like to think back to basics is like, okay, where do cacti naturally grow? The desert. Does it rain every day in the desert? No. Does it rain every week in the desert? Still no. So does that mean I'm gonna water my cactus every day? No. So that's kind of a good place to, to start as well thinking, hmm, what does my plant need? What does it want? How often should I be watering it? Think back to its traditional ecosystem. Of course, it's easy for a cactus. Yeah, they grow in the desert. Not everyone knows where a pothos naturally grows. If you're having a hard time figuring out what your plant is, there are so many amazing apps out there where you can take a picture and it will tell you what it is or look at the card, throw, throw it into Google. It'll tell you straight away what the plant's needs are, sunlight, watering, but these are some great traditional tips that apply to a lot of plants. The two knuckle rule for starters, absolutely. Um, and yeah, just kind of keeping an eye on the plant itself. Does it look really sad? Is it looking kind of droopy? This plant here is another one of the um, plants listed in NASA's clean air study. It's one of the best at removing toxins from the air and they're so gorgeous. You see them at friggin' grocery stores. Let's see if I can pick it up here. But this guy, this is a spathophyllum or a peace lily. You can see its flowers kind of coming up here. Big white flowers. Does this look familiar to some of you folks? This guy is really easy to care for, but I will tell you it's a drama queen. When it needs water, it tells you. So that is kind of nice for some people who just want to be told what to do with their plants because this one will just look really, you know, floppy and sad. And then you give it a watering and she perks right back up. Another amazing plant for removing those toxins from the air. One thing I should also note about most of these plants that are really, really effective at removing toxins from the air is they can be toxic to pets. You have to think that they're removing these toxins from the air and then they're storing those toxins in their bodies. So if your pet were to, you know, eat one of the leaves and it's really only if ingested, I have a dog. My dog doesn't show any interest in my plants, but I know that I get this question a lot from my cat people out there, which is why I'm a dog person. Cats are so curious about plants. And, you know, I have so many people, oh, my cat eats all my plants. Like, What's something you recommend for, you know, a cat person whose cat eats everything? Well, for starters, don't get any toxic plants. That's very, very important. Uh, most philodendrons are toxic. A lot of palms can be toxic. This guy here is toxic. Monster deliciosa is beautiful but toxic. Um, but one thing that I really like to recommend to pet owners or anyone who has a cat or even a dog that really likes just getting into your, your plants and... Uh, kind of messing them up is uh terrariums how cool are these so terrariums is actually kind of how i got started with the urban botanist was you know gardening under glass engaging with nature in an urban setting while kind of creating a little snapshot of an ecosystem inside of a terrarium and I kind of like to start out with explaining what is a terrarium? What is it? What does that mean, Emma? 
And a terrarium is basically a self-sustaining, self-regulating ecosystem. Any terrarium that has a lid on top, you literally never have to water. I made this terrarium three years ago and I've never watered it. How crazy is that? These are perfect for the low maintenance gardeners because um, you actually never have to do anything to it. It just lives and thrives and survives. It's a self-regulating ecosystem and great for cat owners because the cat's not getting in here. These are really, really fun and a great way to kind of get creative and learn a little bit more about ecosystems and kind of essentially try to perfectly replicate an environment captured inside of a vessel. We do workshops on these. Uh, we sell kits that include all of the stuff in it that you need to make your own terrarium. That's on our website. Um, if you want to learn more about how to make your own terrarium and where to get started. We also have a bunch of videos on our YouTube channel about that if you are terrarium curious at all. Okay, let's go back to more plants that I suggest for beginners. This will be the next one that I recommend. And this is called a ZZ plant or Zanzibar gem. You can see again, it kind of has those thick fleshy leaves, almost like a waxy leaf. So you'll kind of see a trend with my easy plants that I'm recommending in that they don't really need to be watered all that often. I haven't watered this plant in like two months. And that's not because I'm negligent. It's because it actually prefers to go for longer periods of time without water than too much water for too long. It's in kind of the same family as a succulent in that it's nice and thick and fleshy. These are also great at removing toxins from the air, um, similar to the NASA clean air study that I mentioned. So this one is uh, one that I definitely recommend. I see these all the time at Ikea, um, pretty easy to find. And they're just, they're just stunning. They're absolutely gorgeous. They get really, really big. This one's just a baby, um, but you can get them in all shapes and sizes. And they're just a really cool plant. So this is another one that I recommend, and that's a ZZ gem or a ZZ plant, Zanzibar gem. Really, really pretty. Okay, I did also want to show you guys this really cool method of propagation because we did talk about propagating with the pothos and I showed you how easy it was with just putting a cutting directly into water and watching roots grow. So this is another method of propagation which I tried in the last few months and it has shown to be successful. This was a leaf from one of my peperomias and I just cut the tip of the leaf off and stuck it in soil. And look at the roots it's grown. And look at the little baby plant growing off the top. How cute is that? So this is another method of propagation. There are several different methods uh, depending on the plant and what you have available to you. But I just had this one aside and I meant to mention it when I was showing the propagation with this plant. But how cute is that? Look at that little baby. I just get really excited about this stuff. So I kind of jump from tangent to tangent. Um, and that was one of my tangents. Okay, um, let's jump into plant care. We've talked kind of about watering. We've talked a little bit about, um, you know, the types of plants that I recommend to beginners, um, people that maybe aren't all that confident in what to go out and buy uh, for their space. I promise you that these three plants, actually four plants, the big spathy phylum, Peace Lily here that I showed you guys. These are amazing for anyone. Doesn't matter if you have a lot of sun, you have no sun, you've got a dry space, you've got a humid space, it doesn't matter. These are the most resilient plants. And I promise you, if you're looking to add greenery into your space and you get yourself one of these, you're gonna be in great shape. They're hard to kill, they're super resilient, and uh, they do well in low light spaces. So. I find a lot of people come to me and they're like, well, I live in a condo building. I don't really get a lot of sun. I have two windows in my whole place. Um, and those windows are blocked by other buildings. So you don't really end up having a lot of natural sunlight. And these are a really good starting point. So I would recommend these. Once again, that was a snake plant or a sansevieria, ZZ plant and a pothos. 
These are awesome. And you know, they're kind of great because they're different kind of shapes and sizes. So if you're wanting something that kind of has a bit of a cascading growth, or you have something that you kind of want to put on the floor on your, on your tabletop, there's some good options here. Now, when you're going out and shopping for plants, this is another thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, I love giving people some tips on how to shop for plants, what to avoid and what to kind of look for when you're shopping for your plants. Um, first things first is I really like to take a picture of the space that I'm looking to fill. Maybe it's your living room, maybe it's your bathroom, maybe it's a kitchen, or maybe it's just a corner of your house. Before heading out and starting my plant shopping, I'll take a picture of that space. And the reason for that is, is because I'll go into a nursery or I'll go, you know, somewhere where there typically are plant experts nearby. And I'll say, hey, I'm looking for something that will work in the corner of my house. Well, this person's never been to your house. So, oh, pull up that picture. They can see, okay, yeah, she's got a self-facing window. That's kind of indirect light right there. Perfect. I can recommend you A, B, C, D. Great. Easy breezy. Another thing and another reason why I love to take pictures of the space that I'm looking to fill is if you're kind of looking at a plant that might appear quite big, you can kind of get a better visualization on how well that plant is going to fit into that particular space. You know, you might be have just moved into that space or you might have a new table there or a new chair and you're not entirely familiar with how big it is having that picture as um you know something to go back to and look at is also really helpful for just kind of visually piecing together the space that you're looking to fill so taking a picture is kind of my step one when you're going out and shopping for plants a step two is of course having a good look at the plant before you take it home are you noticing any holes are there any little critters crawling around you know are there is there any webbing you know sometimes webbing can be an innocent spider but a lot of the times it can be spider mites which is really really bad I've made the mistake several times of bringing something home and maybe I missed that little bit of webbing and now I have a full-blown spider mite infestation which they're not anything of an issue to humans you barely see them they're very very tiny but they will destroy your plant collection and to that point, when you bring your new plant baby home, you want to quarantine it. And I mean, you want to keep it away from any other plants that you might already have at home, just in case it has something on it. Maybe it's got mealybugs. Maybe it's got aphids. Maybe it has the dreaded spider mites. For those of you who have experienced these before, you know what I'm talking about. These are a lot of the common household plant pests that... Um, I like to bring up because I get a lot of questions. You can imagine people sending me pictures. Oh, I don't know what's wrong with my plant. You know, I, I water it. It's getting enough sun. I'm doing everything right. You know, I know what the species is. It's, it's in indirect light. I only water it once a week. You're doing everything seemingly correct. But what you may not have done just yet is taken a closer look. And sometimes that's all you need to do to notice. Oh, wow. Look at that teeny tiny, most of the time they are very, very small, most of these pests. And mealybugs, for example, can just look like a little white fluff on your plants. Kind of scary to think about. But if you have a plant at home that is struggling and you don't know why, it might be that, that it has some pests on it. I'll show you this one, for example. It just breaks my heart looking at this Calathea freddy. Look at how beautiful the foliage is on this plant. This was huge and full all winter, even into spring. It was my pride and joy. It was on the center of my coffee table. And then it just started looking yellow. Look at the leaves started to kind of furl in and crisp. And I was like, what the hell is going on with this plant? It's getting, I, it's getting everything I could possibly give it. All of my love, all my affection, all my attention. And so, you know, it just goes to show it can happen to everyone and it does happen to everyone. It's only natural. If you're bringing plants inside, pests can come with them. Luckily for you, the pests will stay on the plant. They're not going to crawl around your house aimlessly. 
but not so good for your plant is, yeah, they're going to stick around until they have sucked every last bit of nutritional juice, which is what these do, out of the leaves of your plant. So that was what happened with this guy. This is a Calathea Freddy. I mean, I'm trying to salvage him, um, but yeah, he's definitely on the struggle train. So, you know, I've, I've given him a treatment basically and have kept, I've kept checking. Usually these buggers are on the bottoms of the leaves, but how I've managed those issues and how you can at home, here's another one that is just starting to show signs of not being happy. And so I did a quick look over this guy and he had a couple thrips, uh, another pest. Um, but you, your plants will tell you when they're not happy. And yellowing is usually either a sign of underwatering or overwatering. And you should know what that is. Oh, I haven't watered it in like four weeks or three weeks. Oh, I probably need to water it. Or no, I just watered it yesterday. I don't know what's wrong with it. You might be overwatering. If it's neither and the soil, you're doing the two knuckle rule, Emma, I promise you I'm doing all the things that you recommended. But the leaves are still turning yellow and kind of getting like crispy brownness on the end. It might have a pest, which is fine. You can deal with these things, I promise you. So how to deal with these pests, insecticidal soap. You can buy insecticidal soap at um, most department stores um, in the garden center. Of course, your local nursery will have something like this. It's usually in a concentrate, so you have to dilute it. But you can also make your own at home. Insecticidal soap is essentially water mixed with um, like a very mild dish detergent uh, soap. And basically, it doesn't affect your plant by spraying it on the plant. Um, I'll just spray some here. But I kind of just spray it on the bottom of the plant leaf or anywhere that I'm seeing any critters crawling around. And um, you leave it on, I kind of repeat every two days, just to make sure I completely eradicate the, uh, the pests. And so that is kind of a good thing to have on hand at home, um, just in case of emergencies, nothing worse than noticing, oh, frig, I have spider mites. And some of these pests move really quick. Um, and you don't have something like this on hand. Um, I just like to recommend it. But that's my other tip for when you're shopping for plants is when you bring them home, before you bring them home, make sure you're not seeing any pests. Um, make sure that the root system looks healthy. Sometimes it's really easy to just lift them up out of their nursery pots. And yeah, the roots are looking good. Um, maybe I'll need to repot this one if they're really, really root bound. Um, and then quarantine it when you get home. Important things to do so that you're not spreading any potential pests that are hiding to your plant collection at home repotting a plant. I also get that question all the time. Um, when you're repotting a plant, you know, let's say you're repotting, doesn't matter what size it is, but um, you always want to go up a size no bigger than two inches in diameter. So you wouldn't want to repot something like this into a pot that's way, way, way larger than its original pot. So if you're kind of have a plant at home that you're like, mm, it's been a while since I repotted this guy, plants typically need to be repotted every two years. Um, I always suggest and recommend not going any larger than about two inches in diameter for its new pot. And that's so that the plant doesn't get stressed out. The roots are getting the water it needs when you're watering your plant and it's not kind of going all around the outside to where, you know, the water doesn't need to be going. It's going right to the roots, right to the important part of the plant. And um, that's just the perfect size to go up in is about two inches in diameter for that guy there. Um, I'm going to show you guys this since we were talking about pests. These might look familiar to some folks. These are called sticky traps. They are the best for fruit flies if you have fruit flies. Um, also amazing for fungus gnats. And if you have houseplants at home, you can even have one houseplant at home. You might notice little tiny flies flying around and they're not fruit flies. They're fungus gnats. Um, little tiny, tiny flies. They're not a pain. They actually don't even cause that much damage to your plants. Um, they're just annoying. 
But I like to get these sticky traps. You can see how small the flies are. They're really, really small. Um, and they actually help with a lot of other pests too. So the, the mites that I mentioned, the thrips that I mentioned, um, white fly. So these I, I like using, um, just putting it kind of in the side of my pot. And when the flies fly up, they're actually attracted to yellow as well. They'll just get stuck in those sticky traps. Um, these again, Home Depot Canadian Tire, I highly recommend. There aren't many traps that work as well as this does. So if you have fungus gnats at home or if you've got little pesky flies fluttering around at home, I would suggest using these guys here. Amazing, amazing. Okay, one last thing I'm going to talk about and then we can start our Q&A session is uh, fertilizers. Only because I get asked this question all the time. Should I be fertilizing? What do I fertilize with, Emma? How does it work? What's the deal? So essentially what fertilizer is, think back to again, we're trying to replicate these plants' natural ecosystems inside of our homes. And in those natural ecosystems, there'd be decaying matter. There'd be um, lots of natural vitamins being constantly introduced to the soil uh, substrate mix. Because we don't really have that inside of our homes, you do want to provide your plants with a fertilizer uh, a few times during the growing season, so spring and summer. You don't ever want to provide your plants with fertilizer during the winter. A lot of people think, oh, well, it's not getting much sun, or oh, she's looking really sad this winter. I'm going to give it a boost of fertilizer. No. Do not do that. It stresses out the plant. You can actually stress them out so much that they die. You want to save fertilizers for the spring and the summer. And depending on the plant, you can give them three to six uh, feedings of fertilizer in that, in that uh, period of time. Um, and a fertilizer I like to use personally, I like to stick to organic stuff. So nothing that's synthetic or chemical. And in my opinion, and in a lot of people's opinion, the absolute best natural organic fertilizer that you can use for your plants. I mean, literally, you can have a plant that is on its last legs. It's got like three leaves left. It's hanging on for dear life. Basically, this guy here. Oh, he ain't happy. Um, you can give them a shot of this type of fertilizer and they bounce right back. Um, this is just one brand that I use, Jocelyn Soil Booster. But what this is is called worm castings. And before I scare too many of you folks off, worm castings is literally exactly what it sounds like. I almost said smells like. It doesn't have a smell. But it's basically worm poop. I know, right? It literally just looks like dirt, smells, feels, everything like dirt. Um, but it's, it's called vermicomposting. And it is like super, super high in all of the natural like um, microorganisms that plants need for healthy root growth. This company is actually based out of Toronto. Um, it's a small locally owned business, Jocelyn Soil Booster. Um, but if you can find worm castings at Home Depot, uh, I think these are like 20 bucks a bag. Um, this is amazing stuff for your indoor and outdoor gardens, especially if you're an outdoor gardener. This is going to boost your garden like nothing else. I swear by this stuff. It's amazing. Doesn't matter what brand you're getting, of course. Um, I really like using this brand specifically because um, what she does in her small business does is they drive around to local Toronto you know, restaurants and businesses and collect all of their scraps, their food scraps. And they use that in their vermicomposting, which is worm composting. Um, so it's kind of a great way to, you know, lessen your carbon footprint. It removes a lot of waste and garbage from our garbage dumps. And um, she's making some awesome stuff. So if you're looking for a good fertilizer, I really recommend that. Um, okay, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. Um, Amanda's going to read out the questions in the chat. So if you have any questions or if you've already typed them in there, she's going to get to them. I'm going to start kind of um, going through the questions. Yes, worm poop. I'm telling yeah. you, 
good stuff. I make my own work. I make my own compost as well. So that's a really good point, Glenda. I actually have a little worm farm. Um, my boyfriend just loves living with me. Um, I have a worm farm and I'm making my own worm poop. So it's really exciting. But yes, absolutely make your own compost. Um, Amanda's going to start reading out some questions. And so, I love it. Perfect. So worm poop is definitely the hashtag of the day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Great. So I've just been making a note of some of the questions. So uh, just to start with, Lisa had asked about uh, good plans for basement units or indirect sunlighting, which you ended up answering. Um, so we can, so you mentioned the pothos, the snake plant, yes, the ZZ absolutely. plant and the peace lily. Uh, we can go to Kelly's question, which was, what is your opinion on glass water globes to help with watering? I think that those are great um, if you don't want to go out and buy a glass water globe. And for those of you who don't know what that is, um, it's basically a glass ball with a long kind of flute on the end and you fill it with water and it slowly delivers water to your plant. You know, if you're going away to the cottage for two weeks or something like this, um, but you can actually make them yourselves at home. I made my own uh, using a wine bottle and I basically made a hole through the cork and I filled the wine bottle with water, not wine. Plants don't love wine. <laughs> um, and then I stuck the cork back in. I had the hole in it and I stuck the, uh, the nozzle into my, my peace lily actually. And those work really well. So the glass globes, absolutely. They're a great way to sort of slowly water your plants if you're going away for a week or two to the cottage. Yeah. Great question. Okay. Great. Um, Antonia had a question about, uh, well, she asked if you had any advice on what to do with orchids that she has a lot of leaves growing at the bottom and it's causing the plant to kind of topple over. Okay. So I'm going to be completely transparent with you guys. I always am. My one fake plant in my house and I have literally 250 plants. Um, and that's not a joke is an orchid. And for whatever reason, I just don't have good luck with orchids. I even put real soil in the pot to make myself feel a little bit better about the whole thing. Um, I have a fake orchid. There we go. I said it. You know what? Arrest me. Whatever. This is a safe space. Um, but the reason why I'm saying that is because I just don't have good luck with orchids. Um, I find that they're very temperamental depending on A, the type of orchid you have, everything down to the water that you use. Some people are like, oh, you just throw an an ice cube in and boom, they're perfectly happy. Not this girl. So um, I don't really have the best answer for you there. I know that there are so many amazing orchid groups on Facebook. There's literally Ontario Orchid Group on Facebook. Lots of amazing plant groups um, that you can join. You can post a picture in there and within minutes, you'll have 20 comments of all the orchid fanatics. And it really is a thing. There's like an orchid club out there. Um, where people will be able to help you out with your specific species and your specific issue. I'm just not an orchid person. That's the only plant, indoor plant, that I cannot, I just cannot. So, okay, great. There you go. Um, so uh, Jimmy had asked about the right ratio for plant to pot size, um, but you talked about that. So you shouldn't go with anything uh, very large for a small plant, right? Yeah, that's right. So you wouldn't want to plant something like this little cactus into a big pot like this, for example, um, or a big pot like this. You kind of want to go no bigger than two inches in diameter for the size that you have bought the plant in. So that's a good rule of thumb is this is much too big. So if you're buying a little three inch pot, you only want to go to like a five or a six inch size. So about two inches. Perfect. And Dorothy asked, how would you propagate a ZZ plant? ZZ plants are very easy to propagate. Do I have one here? So this guy I propagated and to propagate this, I'm not going to cut. You can actually cut anywhere on this stem. You can literally cut it here. You can cut it here. You can, you can even take a leaf. Oh my gosh. Look at this guy. This is a leaf of a ZZ plant. And I just put the bottom in, in water and look at the roots growing off of it. It's grown its little rhizome and you can stick that into soil once it's got some roots growing off of it and it, it will grow into a new plant. Um, if you're cutting the stem, what you're going to want to do is, you know, cut your stem kind of like I showed you already. 
And uh, you want to let the wound site callus over, kind of scab over. Because if you stick that into soil or um, water too quickly, it can kind of rot, but um, you can just cut anywhere on the stem and stick it into soil, stick it into water, and it'll grow into a whole new little baby. Good question. Great. Thanks, Emma. Um, Dorothy asks, why does soil sometimes turn white on the top? That's a good question. Um, soil can sometimes turn white on top if you're overwatering. Um, basically, that's like a really light household mold, which sounds gross. It's not that gross. You can literally scrape it off. Um, but basically, that happens when the top of your soil is staying too moist for too long, aka you're probably overwatering a little bit. Um, so that's that will tend to happen. It happens on my house plants too. It just happens. Um, but it's not the end of the world. You can scrape it off um, and just kind of monitor how much watering you have that you're giving your plant. Perfect. Um, and Annika asked, how do you harvest seeds from your plant as they naturally release them in the summer so that you can replant them? Yeah, good question. I actually just did that today myself with my arugula plants outside. Um, so I was going to do a little section on on how to plant your your um, seedlings because a lot of people again who don't want to get into house plants a great segue into house plants is just herbs because they tend to be a lot easier to care for um, and you know buying seeds is nothing you can just buy some seeds and start your own little your little um, herb garden and they're easy to easy breezy but um, with harvesting seeds from your plants it really all depends on what the plant is um you know for example i just took mine from my arugula um i noticed the pods starting to come off and i would just take take one of the pods i opened it up took the seeds out i'm letting the seeds dry out a bit and then i and then i'm gonna plant them and see if if that works um yeah that's that's really all there is to it you have to find the the seed pods and it's different for all plants but um that's how you would do it basically great um and i have two fairly similar questions from glenda and christian uh so both of them are having issues with yellowing leaves uh but glenda has a bamboo plant and christian has a tomato plant so I'm wondering if you have any advice is that just overwatering or underwatering okay um so for both of those um, it, of course, could be over or under watering. Another thing that could be um, causing that is the pH levels. Um, depends if you're giving your tomato plant outside. Are you giving it miracle Grow? Are you giving it any sort of um, fertilizers that may be too pH heavy? Sometimes that can show in your um, outdoor crops, any of your herbaceous plants. Um, you kind of want to keep an eye on the pH levels. Um, and for your bamboo plants, that is such a common question that I get. You wouldn't believe it. Um, with bamboo plants turning yellow, sometimes it can be, again, the pH in the water that you're even providing it with. Is it, and it also depends. Some people put their bamboo plants in just a, you know, container of water. Some people have their bamboo plants in soil slash in a sand sort of, um, substrate. Um, so you kind of want to keep an eye on how much water is in there. Sometimes um, there's th it dries out and there's not enough and you kind of have to introduce more water, but it could be the type of water that you're giving it. Um, some places out here are on a hard water system, so that can really affect your plants and bamboos are, are particularly susceptible to that. So maybe try using um, distilled water and see if that makes a difference. Great. Um, Annalisa asked, how can she protect her roses before winter? If you have any advice. Um, I can't say for sure. I'm more of an indoor plant person, um, but outdoor plants, at least this is my first year having an outdoor, having the space for an outdoor garden. I've always been like a condo person um, and all of my outdoor plants I'm going to be covering, I'm going to be first before the frost hits, I'm going to be pruning. Um, I'm going to be pruning the right way for that particular plant. Um, and then I'm going to be covering a lot of them with like a burlap sack, which I'm pretty sure is 
the correct method to go about for rose bushes. You want to make sure that you're protecting them as much as possible from our harsh winters. Um, so that's that's something that I would maybe do a little bit more research on. I'm sure the answer is as easy as how to protect roses in winter and probably Google will tell you the answer straight away. That's my always my go to is if I don't know, I'm like, just Google it. It might be there. My outdoor plant um, knowledge is not as great as my indoor plants. I'm sort of an indoor tropical girl. So I'm sorry if that wasn't too detailed, but that's what I would do. Great. Um, and Lisa asked if you can also propagate with a peace lily. You can propagate any plant. You can propagate any plant, which is amazing. And another cool thing that not a lot of people realize is any plant, any green plant, like a lot of people will see something like this or, you know, a snake plant or a cactus or a monstera, any green plant will flower believe it or not. So similar to the propagation, any, any green plant will flower. Some people will send me pictures of their snake plant flowering and they're like, what the hell? I didn't know that these flowered and it's pushing out a shoot and it's got these cool, like kind of cylindrical flowers. And it's kind of, I always say, I always respond back with all green plants flower. So it's kind of cool to think about. Perfect. Um, so Jimmy asked, uh, he mentioned that his indoor pots don't actually have holes at the bottom. And mm -hmm. he was wondering if he can just be careful with overwatering or should he really get some holes in the pot? That is such a good question. And I'm happy that I'm able to touch upon that. Um, drainage is definitely those holes in the bottom for those of you who are not sure the holes in the bottom of your pot or drainage holes are definitely important for something like a cactus. You know, a lot of people will plant cacti and succulents into like a cute mug or, you know, a pot that doesn't have drainage. And if you're not completely on top of how much you are over or underwatering, you're gonna have some issues. Um, so if you don't have pot uh, holes in the bottom of your pot, like this Ikea one doesn't have any, um, it's not the end of the world. Um, I try to drill holes in the bottom of my pots if I if they don't have them already. Um, but you just want to keep an eye on again, how much are you watering? Um, that two knuckle rule, really important. Um, of course, you don't want to have basically what you don't want to have is water build up in the bottom because um, that will lead to root rot, which is no good. Another thing that you can do when you're potting a plant into, let's say you have a pot like this pot, I love this pot that I got. There's no drainage holes in the bottom, which is kind of annoying. But I know that I'm on top of my watering. I'll probably put something like this in here that doesn't need a lot of watering to begin with. So I am probably going to easily be able to avoid um, overwatering this guy. Um, but what I will do is I'll put a little layer of gravel in the bottom, um, pumice stones, maybe a little bit of charcoal. And that's just to add a little bit of aeration to the base of your pot. And um, that can that can help. That can absolutely help with um, with avoiding overwatering. But uh, I always try to I always try to lean towards having a pot that does have have holes. The other thing too, actually, I should mention is perfect example is this pot here, right? It doesn't have any holes in the bottom, but this nursery pot does. So what I'll do is when I need to water it, I'll take the pot out. I'll bring it over to my sink and I'll give it a good watering. I'll let all the water drip out the bottom. So none of that water sitting in the bottom of this pot, rotting out all the roots. And then once it's drip dry, I'll take it back over and I'll put it in its pot. And that's called um, cache pots. So if you want to just do that, that's nice and easy. You kind of avoid having to get your area or your hands dirty. You don't need to repot it. So that's another method that you can do too, is just leaving it in its nursery pot. Because nursery pots always have drainage holes. And just kind of sticking them in there like that. And that works pretty flawlessly too. 
Okay, great. Uh, this is perfect. Thank you so much. So we've reached the end of our session. Emma, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for taking the time and uh, speaking with us. That was really great. I feel like I have a lot of hashtags in my mind. <laughs> Safe space is another one. Um, and just a big thank you to everyone for joining too. We hope you all had a lot of fun um, with the presentation and you learned a lot. And uh, hopefully you'll all go out and buy some more plants to add to your space. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining me. And um, we are at the Urban Botanist on Facebook and Instagram. So if you're looking for any more green spo or plant inspiration, you can follow us there. We're always posting tips, tricks, cool plants, where we see them, where to get them um, on those platforms. I'm also there if you ever have questions. If you have a plant at home, and you're not sure what it is, or you're not sure what's happening to it. I love getting plant questions. My DMs are usually flooded with pictures of people's plants and I, I literally love it. So if you do have any more questions that I didn't get a chance to get to, please feel free to reach out over our social platforms. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone have a great rest of your day. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.